welcome to my channel. My name is Trevor Meredith and I'll be walking you through how to paint this skull. I can't show you guys everything. In the end I had about five hours worth of video footage that I had to cut down into a reasonable period of time. So we'll kind of be jumping around a little bit but you're not going to miss anything. The techniques, the tools, the process that I use to render the texture and the rest of the skull are pretty much the same regardless of which portion of the skull you're working on. So with that being said, let's just jump into it. So to get to this point, I initially sketched the entire design out, including the skull and the portrait I've already completed above on a large sheet of paper to make sure I was happy with the placement and that the proportions were good. I then cut out parts of that sketch and used it as a stencil to give myself a roadmap for the painting process. And this skull is all about texture, so I start building texture from the very beginning by throwing down some stipple. Basically all I'm doing is working the airbrush trigger back and forth to load the needle with paint while I'm kinking the air hose. So when I release the hose, the paint at the end of the needle is forced out and it creates a stipple effect. And this is very subtle. It doesn't take much in my opinion. In fact, I'll, some of this won't even be visible in the end. So I, I like the less is more approach for this. And I don't necessarily want nice little, almost perfectly round dots all over the skull. So as you can see, I'm using my fingers here to kind of smudge out the ones that are still wet. For paint, I'm using Createx Wicked Detail Smoke Black for this entire video. It's reduced with their high performance reducer at probably around a 70-30 mix, meaning 70% reducer and 30% paint. And my reduction ratio will vary a little bit depending on what I'm doing, but for the most part it it's stays pretty much around the 70-30 mix. And I'm generally spraying at about 15 to 20 PSI. One of the cool things with the Createx line of paints is they are relatively easy to manipulate and that's what I'm about to do here. I'm dusting color on the top of the skull and then I'm going to use another product to weaken that paint. And This technique will work with any ammonia based cleaner or isopropyl alcohol. If you are going to try the rubbing alcohol for the first time I'd recommend you experiment on something other than your project first as it's a lot more aggressive than say Windex which is what I'm using. So I sprayed Windex directly onto the artwork and then I let that sit for a few seconds before I start dabbing the surface with the wadded up paper towel to manipulate the paint. And as you can see, it's lifting some of the color. So the longer you let the chemical sit on the paint, the easier it is to remove. But I don't necessarily want to remove all of the paint. My goal is to push and pull the color to create more texture. This technique will also generally work better with a wet or a heavy coat of paint and it responds better to the Createx illustration line versus the Wicked or the Auto Air paints. So the light dust coat that I sprayed was pretty much dry as soon as it hit the surface and the reason I used that very light dust coat is because I didn't want to go too dark. So in the end I wound up spraying the surface with Windex a couple of times and using a little more pressure as well as a twisting motion with the paper towel to finally get the effect I was looking for. But I got there and I was pretty happy with the result. In fact, what you see here is pretty much finished for the top of the skull. I did do a little bit of work with these some erasers, but for the most part, the top of the skull was finished at this point. Jumping forward some, you can see I've filled in the background and I've done a little bit of work above the eye socket that I'm beginning to paint now. And I know filling in the nose and eye sockets is not a very technical portion when it comes to painting a skull. However, I brought you guys to this point to make a point. I see a lot of artists fill in the nose and the eye sockets with just a solid tone or a solid color. And there you get a glimpse of my reference photo. I almost always recommend using some type of photo reference even if you're painting something you've completely made up. Using a photo reference or references will make your work more believable. So back to my point. I see a lot of artists fill in the nose and the eye sockets with just a solid color. And there's nothing wrong with that. If, if that's the look you're going for, that's great. But if you're looking for, and I don't want to say photorealism, but a more realistic or a detailed look or, you know, just that edge that will take your work to the next level, then 
pay more attention to the shadows. While those areas are very dark, there's almost always some light reflecting off of something even in the darkest shadows. And remember, as the artist, you have artistic license. Just because you're using a photo reference doesn't mean you have to copy what you see exactly. I changed some things on this skull to suit the look and the effect that I was looking for. I prefer to work freehand. If I need a hard edge, I will generally use a shield. And in this case, the overspray actually works to my advantage. And we'll talk some more about that here in a little bit. One disadvantage I find with the water-based paints is it takes some time to fill in those dark areas because you have to work in light layers. You know, I used urethane for years on all my automotive work and I had a pretty steep learning curve when I switched to water-based. You know, with the, the urethane you can hammer the paint on with no issues, but the water-based stuff doesn't react well to that, so it requires some patience. So we will skip ahead just a little bit. Now, I don't have sponsors or get paid for using any of these products. Everything I use, I've paid for out of my own pocket, and I share it with you because it works. The Helix Electric Eraser, for example. This is one of my go-to tools. You can get white eraser heads or gray eraser heads for this thing, and you will see me use both of them. The white eraser is less aggressive, and the gray is more aggressive. And I'm actually painting the skull on the hood of my own Jeep, which was white to begin with. Having a pre-existing white finish allows me to erase the highlights rather than using white paint and dealing with color shifts. Erasers are also a great tool for building texture. Notice there's only a light layer of paint in the upper portion of the eye socket at this point. I'm using the helix to add a little bit of texture within that socket by just erasing in kind of a random dot-like pattern. That light layer of paint, or overspray as I talked about earlier, allows these details to show through contrast. I'm using the less aggressive white eraser tip because I don't want to remove a lot of paint at this point. Again, the less is more approach. And then I'll actually push these highlights back with more paint to the point that they are very subtle and barely noticeable, but still there. Again, those little details like that will really add to the illusion of dimension in your work. And now you can see I'm using the helix to cut an edge on the bridge of the nose back in. Rather than masking that area off earlier, I find it easier and faster most of the time to just use the eraser to cut it back in. Not to mention the fact that the overspray generated from painting earlier without masking allows me to easily add texture. And now I'll push the texture and highlights I just created within the socket back, as well as begin to build just a hint of some texture outside of the socket with the airbrush. But again, the socket won't be solid black. I'll leave a little portion around the top where I added the texture slightly lighter than the rest of it. 
moving on to the lower end of the skull and now we get into creating the texture and other details that really bring this thing to life and you get a better look at some of the stipple I applied at the very beginning now I just sprayed a very light layer of color to create contrast before returning with the eraser I wanted a lot of texture in the skull because I was going for a very aged appearance so you can see I'm using the eraser to add striations now rather than small dots to create the kind of the grain of the bone. So this is a constant back and forth process of adding color with the airbrush, subtracting color with the erasers, and then repeating that process. How many layers does it take? That's completely up to you as the artist. And taking the extra time to build those individual layers is time consuming. Like I said at the beginning, I had about five hours invested in just this skull. But the payoff in the end, I think, is well worth the effort. And you'll notice when I add layers of paint, I use very light layers because I want to push highlights and the texture I've created back, but I don't want to completely cover all the work I've already done underneath. I want to keep a transparent quality. I also use pencil erasers. Pencil erasers work great for larger areas and they create softer blends compared to the helix. I have one that is less aggressive and one that is more aggressive. The white tipped eraser I'm using here with the brush on the end of it is the more aggressive of the two. So essentially I use the same approach whether I'm holding the airbrush or an eraser when it comes to building texture and detail. With the airbrush I can spray in a modeled fashion or I can spray random small dots and striations I can do the same with the eraser. The only difference is one tool adds paint while the other removes it. I can darken an area with the airbrush and lighten the same area with the eraser. So when used together, you can achieve some killer results. Moving back to the top of the skull, you can see there's a pretty defined line between the texture I created earlier with the Windex and a paper towel and the layer of paint I applied before creating that texture. I wanted to show you how I blend those two areas together. I use erasers to remove paint and I'm trying to mimic the texture above. 
The rest of the process is very similar to what we've already covered. Going back and forth between tools, pushing details back with the airbrush and then pulling them forward again with erasers. This is another eraser I use frequently. It's a wedge eraser that has a soft or less aggressive side and a hard or more aggressive side. And this thing is great for really large areas. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. There's so much more I would like to have included, but it would have taken hours and I know the YouTube attention span isn't that great. And there's really nothing groundbreaking here. All of this stuff has been around for a long time. But when I started airbrushing more than 25 years ago, it was a lot of trial and error. We didn't have the resources that are available today. So, you know, I love what I do, and I love showing others how I do it. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and share. And if there's anything you'd like to learn or something you'd like to see me paint, Leave a comment below and I'll do my best to get it done. Thanks for watching.